I'm not a misanthrope by any stretch. I like hanging out with people. I love meeting people in, in person. But, you know, with the pandemic thing, this is, wow. You know, we couldn't have done this 10 years ago. You know, this is, uh, this is amazing. I get to come to my opening and stay at home. So let's see, we have most of the people here, I think. Yeah, quite a few are coming on. Many people I recognize, a few I don't, which is always nice. Get back to you. So today we have Dennis Siminski on, and it's going to be kind of an interesting um, virtual show for his Grand Canyon State uh, on many levels. One is that this will be a, a podcast as well. Now, you can hear Dennis on a podcast that we did a few years ago, or yeah, I think it might have been a couple of years ago, if you want to get the backstory, but we're going to talk a little bit about that backstory as well today. Um, so Dennis, what I'd like to do, if possible, is uh, let's just talk a little bit about your backstory, because it's interesting. I, knew, I mean, we're here for a virtual show, and, and we've got these amazing paintings we're going to discuss, but I think a little context uh, would be good, and maybe you could just start with... Uh, if they want the back backstory, go to your other old podcast, but we could start with, you know, when you went to CCA, you graduated with a BFA in um, fine arts in what, about 1980, something like that? It was actually 1972, way, way back, but that's okay. I, I think 80 think sounds better because that sounds like you're younger. I, I would go with 80 personally. Okay, okay. 80, 80 sounds good. <laughs> and um, I, I actually graduated in a specific field illustration because somebody told me when I was starting to go to art school, I went to San Jose State first and just generally uh, did art. Uh, and then I was in the Navy for a little bit and somebody said, oh, you're not gonna get anywhere in art unless you have a rich grandmother. The best way to do it is through the back door called illustration. And so, I love depicting things anyway. And so that's what I took. And that's what uh, I graduated with a uh, concentration, I guess you'd call it, in illustration. So that's where I started my career, in illustration. And so from, and from there, actually in 1980 is when you went to New York, right? New York City was in? Yes, exactly. So that's really when I started my education. Yeah, that is. That is really, right? I mean. Well, you know. I went there. I was in San Francisco for a, a few years and uh, it was good. You know, I was starting to make some momentum with the career. And then uh, somebody also said, you know, you go to New York, you know, you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. The old expression goes. And so I packed up my bags and, and left for New York for, for about six years. And that's, it really uh, pushed the career up nicely. It was, uh, I started getting a lot of, uh, uh, good assignments, uh, book covers. Uh, I did uh, the seventh, uh, the fifty seventh annual Academy Awards for CBS. We have and, that up, actually. I don't know if you can see yeah. that, but yeah. So, <laughs> so you did the for that, yes. Uh, they love they love my lettering. I did a lot of book covers that had hand lettering on them, and uh, there were mystery novels, and so I tried to make them look like old. 1940s Humphrey Bogart um, uh, mysteries, you know, with the with the shadowy lettering, um, and so uh, then CBS said, I mean, not CBS, I'm sorry, ABC asked uh, the art directors there asked, can you can you take that lettering and and use it and uh, for for the Academy Awards? I said, sure. That had to be kind of exciting, right? Because you're a young guy when you're doing this, right? Right. Oh, yeah. It was, it was kind of like, hey, you know, you never wanted to tell people what you were doing until it was printed. Because it, 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 that's what would happen. You'd say, you know, I'm doing this great thing for the Academy Awards. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you tell all your friends around dinner, you know, you, you brag as much as you could. And then they'd cancel it or they'd get somebody else to do it because uh, of one thing or another. And it's kind of like, you never, you don't want to jinx it by telling anybody that, you, that this is going to happen until it is actually printed and out there. You can say, oh yeah, I did that. 
And at that point in time, when you're doing these things and, and when you're in New York, and we'll go over some of the other things you went into, but um, did you consider having a fine art career at that point, you know, working with a gallery or any of that, or that was just so far off in your imagination, you couldn't imagine it? No, all the possibilities were, um, were there. Uh, all the fine galleries were there. I would go to the uh, realist galleries. Um, John Bader, uh, who's did a lot of road trip paintings that I kind of liked uh, during that period, he used to go to, I can't remember the name of galleries exactly right now. I have a few colleagues that would beat me over the head with it, but um, yeah, I'd go to those galleries and I'd say, you know, it'd be fun to do a few of these things, but I have this thing that's really rolling well. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a good income here. I can stay in New York. Uh, you can't live in New York without any money. So I was starting to really get momentum. And so it didn't occur to me that changing careers at that point was a good idea. Well, and you were at a time where you have Basquiat there, Warhol, um, you know, all Lichtenstein, all those pop artists, things are going on too. Did you run in any of those circles or knew who they were or would go and see those shows? I would go and see shows and I would meet a few people now and then, but no, I didn't run in, in those circles. I, I was a member of the Society of Illustrators. They, had, they still have. I go to it every time I go to New York. It's a club on West 63rd Street. Uh, no, East 63rd Street, I'm sorry, near Lexington. And it's a club that's been there since uh, the beginning of uh, the, turn of the, ninth, the turn of the 20th century. Uh, so, um, yeah, all Dixon, the, Dixon was a member of that actually. Yes. And I, I, I am too still. Um, and, um, so I'd go there. I have had a gallery show there. That was one of my first gallery shows was at the Society of Illustrators in New York. Um, and you know, you take people, take clients to lunch. They had a great lunch room that has, that had, uh, Norman Rockwell's and J.C. Leindecker's and and all these fantastic illustrators up there, and so you either want to emulate them or follow in their footsteps, and so that was my mindset at that time. And people, I mean, like Warhol's an illustrator, right? I mean, that's really what he started at. As did you get a sense like, wow, this is. Uh, I mean, because clearly, and he was making a lot of money at that time. He was really in his prime from 1980 until his death in, what, 86, I believe. Um, was there any kind of thought on him at all as being a, something you could see as a path or not really? Mm. No, it was an amusement for me at that time. I, I kind of harken back to the older um, uh, you know, the, the illustrators and artists that came before uh, Warhol. NCY uh, types. Yeah, yeah. All, all of the old illustrators and uh, some of the fine artists that were of that period as well. Uh, there's Edward Hopper, um, um, Frank Brangwen, uh, th those people. Mm -hmm. And so you're succeeding in, in New York, and then you you did some other interesting things. And I think Pat may have a few of these images for the people who are just listening to this as a podcast for later on. I'd recommend going to YouTube and you can actually see the images of some of the things that Dennis did. So this little painting right here is actually in my own collection, uh, uh -huh. which was, I think, done for ESPN for the Los Angeles Olympics, correct? Well, uh, almost. Mark. Not ESPN, it was Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated, yeah. exactly. Uh, Sports Illustrated asked me in a 1980, when was that? That was 84, I think. Yeah, 84. Was mm -hmm. And um, so in 84, they, they asked me to do, uh, because my artwork looked very California-esque. I, I love doing neon, palm trees and whatnot. Uh, I used to get a lot of jobs that involved uh, of the uh, flavor of, of the West Coast. 
So uh, Sports Illustrated asked me to do an article all about Los Angeles. And uh, so I did, you know, Santa Anita Parkway, uh, a bunch of other buildings, including this one here. Uh, I put a palm tree with the Los Angeles Theater. The, the front of, I've moved some things around, so it's not actually like that because they had to put type in that big blue sky space there for their magazine. But it was all about the, the 1984 Olympics. I was proud of that one. Yeah, I, I wonder if they would do that kind of thing later on. Well, you also did this, by the way. So um, <laughs> for yeah. any of us who don't want to see this, um, avert your eyes, but the National Lampoon Sports, uh, July of 1982. How did that happen? What's well, that, what that all about? Yeah, I, I'm hopefully not too misogynistic or anything like that, but they... Uh, uh, I don't really know how I got this job, but I had been doing a lot of things for National Lampa and um, some, some other magazines as well. And uh, they liked my figures and the way I treated them. Uh, and uh, so they, they had this special sports or, uh, issue where they, you know, they didn't want to usually have uh, women and in swimsuits and whatnot, but this is a lampoon and they wanted to uh, uh, have one of the cheerleaders swing around and you see her underwear if you get the uh, lettering, uh, you kind of get the uh, view. Just, yeah, the gist of the, of the idea. Now that was a big deal to get a cover of National Lampoon at that time. I mean, that's not an insignificant uh, deal because they were really hot, right? Right, right. And again, I couldn't tell people that I did it until it came out. But and now you can't tell them that you did it because it's 2021. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to get in trouble just now. Yeah. Well, you know, Ed Mel also did a cover as well for National Lampoon. You probably knew that uh, of Minnie Mouse. And I, I think it was in a similar kind of a thing. So you, <laughs> yeah. You do something as an illustrator. And I always tell people too, uh, you know, can you do, they would always ask, can you do figures? Can you do automobiles? Can you do clouds? Can you do trees? Can you, you know, all these different things. And I say, yeah. And then I go home going, oh, boy, I hope <laughs> you do that. And eventually you learn to pay. Hi, Ann, or who is that? Somebody just sneaking in. Ann, you're uh, now going to be in this. Uh, Ann, Ann Zeminski. Uh, I'm trying to stoke the fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, fire welcome place. to the podcast. Ann is also a artist in her own right. And that she works in mosaics, and we have some of her stuff too. Thank you, Mark. Okay, <laughs> just helping me have the Alistair Cook look. Yeah. Um, in the fireplace there. So anyway, yeah, um, we're we're taught to to paint everything, so I can paint trophies and and uh, all all the different uh, uh, things uh, associated with uh, Super Bowls. Uh, this is Super Bowl uh, 29, some time ago. Uh, it's Miami. And all these different things that I had to paint in here, the uh, Guy Lombardo uh, trophy, uh, the uh, Lombardi trophy, I'm sorry. Um, there's also um, an old Hupmobile because the owner had a Hupmobile dealership or his ancestors had a Hupmobile dealership back in the 1920s, and it was in Miami. Hey, Ann, um, we're, we're good on the fire, actually, if you want to just uh, let it go as is. All we can hear is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this you. is the joy of doing Zoom, is we get uh, uh, live interaction. Soon the cat will be coming in. Sorry, anyway, we're back to the... So anyway, uh, yeah. The image of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And so how'd you get that gig? That's a big deal, man, right? Super Bowl, it's, uh, you know, uh, just, they just don't give that out to anybody. Uh, I actually had a friend, um, a colleague, an art director friend, uh, Brad Jans. Uh, he uh, started out with a, a retail store where I did a couple, when I was starting out, he started out to, I think he went to Art Center, 
as you said, I went to uh, California College of the Arts. And uh, so somehow he found my work when I was in San Francisco and, and he was in LA and uh, we started working together. And eventually he became the art director for the NFL. So he asked me, he asked me uh, three or four times to do a Super Bowl poster, even after this one here. But they have about five different artists uh, come up with uh, an image, you know, do a sketch and do an image. And then the committee chooses one. So this is the only one the committee chose out of the four, three or four that I actually did. Do you think it was because of the car? Uh, well, <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> Maybe the clouds. Yeah. And so I'm, when you when you get something like that, you get a, you know, a, a you know, it's an important thing. A lot of people are going to see it. Does that give a kickstart to your career as an illustrator? Do you see that really pick up? People go, I got to have Zeminski do this? Yes, it, it really moves things along. And speaking of uh, imagery in there, the clouds, uh, I started having people tell me, you know, your clouds look a lot like Maynard Dixon. And at that point in time, I hadn't looked up and there wasn't Google in the 80s or whatever, that this was the 90s even to look this fellow up. And eventually I did and I went, whoa, he does pretty good clouds. Uh, <laughs> I should have been uh, honored by that. Uh, but you can see I was doing clouds before I knew about Maynard. <laughs> yeah, May Maynard did the clouds. Maynard did at least a couple of little cars like that during the depression era as well. And there's a very famous one that uh, he did that's in the Phoenix Art Museum, home of the desert rats. So you guys have a couple of things in common. And uh, we threw this in here just to talk about your book illustration career because you've done some great books. I wouldn't say this is your 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 uh, uh, finest literary piece, but I really like the image. And uh, I, I like the book uh, and, and the cover. Okay, yeah, but uh... <laughs> I love the cover. We sat down, and you know, it's funny, and I think maybe this is an interesting thing that people might find interesting is how something like this comes. Uh, about. So I vividly remember in Canyon Road at my gallery, sitting outdoors, I think we had a glass of wine in the back after hours and talking about, I was telling you about this book and what I wanted and, and just kind of explaining the premise and what I thought. And you just started drawing out stuff. And then you brought me, you know, later quite a few different images. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, this is what I, how I see it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. It's, and that's, I like art direction. Uh, I can give myself my own art direction, and that's that's really good too. It's, and it's usually like yourself, Mark. Uh, you uh, get the best results as a director, as a gallery person, and as an art director by letting the artist go ahead and pull out the stops, come up with something that maybe you weren't thinking about. Uh, rather than saying, you know, I want this tree on this rock and this, you know, and you got to you got to do it that way, because then you get kind of a, a lesser version of what you could have had. Yeah, I think that's a true statement that uh, anyone who's listening to this should take um, to heart that if you decide to have an artist do a commission for you, the more leeway you can give the artist and the less direction the better outcome you're gonna have. I've always found that to be the case. And I guess you're um, seconding this uh, concept, aren't you, Dennis? Yeah, yeah. He's raising his hand and saying, yes, because it's true. I mean, you know, you just, it, it allows freedom for creativity. Um, and, you know, when I, I've told people when they come and they have very specific uh, ideations for what they want for a commission, I usually just say, I, I don't think this is a doable thing because you know, you want too many um, components and you're going to, you're not going to get the best results. Right. Right. That's the way I feel about it. Uh, however, I do like input, you know, I can always kind of set that aside. Uh, and, and that's how I work. Yeah. Well, let's see the other books. Here's one that you did. This is for, was for part two of the New Yorker magazine, The Sophisticated Traveler. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Sure. This one, uh, I started getting things from the New York Times and New York Magazine, and the New Yorker, all, all the New York stuff. It was, it was loads of fun. But uh, this one right here, 
uh, was my first sophisticated traveler. I did four more. Uh, this one here, I thought I would uh, show everyone because it has a lot of the West in there, what one might think is the West with the cactus and the horsemen and whatnot. But it's actually, um, uh, I was given about 10 articles that were supposed to appear in the sophisticated traveler section of the New York Times. And there were the Dolomites, uh, Southern Chile, uh, traveling in the Himalayas on horseback, uh, flying into uh, some sort of desert uh, situation. There were a lot of different, so I combined everything. I took liberties and put the Dolomites in the background with the cactus in the foreground and, and uh, made it kind of uh, a landscape, if you will, uh, rather than trying to do this montage. I hate montages. The montages where you take a face here and you take a, an airplane there and you take a whatever and they're all kind of like thrown together without any thought to composition. I like coming up with compositions. And let's look at the next image if we could. This is uh, Tales of the City. Right. I'm Seth Moppin, Tales of the City. I did the first cover and this is the 20th anniversary uh, uh, re-edition of it. And you can see the spine there on the cover. You just see the Golden Gate Bridge and, and uh, the character who arrives in the city. Um, I grew up in, in the Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco. So uh, I think my agent uh, actually uh, got in touch with Armstead Maupin. And it, he had written a letter to me as well and said, since you're in San, you're San Francisco and I like your work, uh, would you want to do this cover? So I'm sure you said yes, <laughs> clearly. Yeah. And, and it's red there because of Maynard Dixon. Um, <laughs> the next one, also who Dixon would know, is Jack London. Tell us a little bit about this. This, okay. is, a fairly, this is a recent Jack, thing. That yeah. uh, Jack London uh, State Park is right just down the block from me, actually a couple of miles away. Uh, I live in Glen Ellen, California, which is where Jack London State Park is. Uh, Jack London decided to, uh, he was born in Oakland and uh, he hung out in the Bay Area, even though he traveled the world, but he set up a ranch. He started building, he built a ranch in Glen Ellen and he called it Valley of the Moon. Uh, and he wrote a book called Value of the Moon, too. So this was a series of posters that the state park asked me to do. I did 18 of them uh, for uh, the state park's anniversary. Uh, so this is the, the, the main one here mm -hmm. uh, with Jack on his horse overlooking the valley. I'm kind of over uh, on that hill there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except there's no trees now because they all got burned out. Um, <laughs> well, I have a few. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. And, and then more of them here. Next image that we have is uh, Kentucky Derby. Now, this one is a really interesting story, and I think you should share it. So what we're looking at, for those who might not be actually uh, watching this on YouTube later, which you should, is uh, number eight, crossing the finish line. That This was a commission that uh, Dennis got for the Kentucky Derby, but there's a little backstory to that, right? Uh, yeah, well, it starts with uh, my uh, uh, co another colleague of mine who uh, knew the art director at Churchill Downs. And so he showed her uh, my work. And since I, I love doing horses, she called me up and said, would you like to uh, do a Kentucky Derby? And I thought it was going to be kind of like uh, one of those... Um, covers for Time Magazine or, or, or the Super Bowl, where you are in competition with five other illustrators or artists. And, and I, I was done with that by 2006. And that's the same year I joined Mark's uh, Medicine Man Gallery. I was done with that. I didn't want to have to be competing with other illustrators. I was already moving on. So, um, so she called uh, 
and ask me. And I said, no, I don't think I will. And both my daughter and uh, my wife uh, were into horses. And they said, if you don't accept this, uh, we're going to disown you. <laughs> uh, and so I said, well, you know, if I'm in, con I asked the art director, if I'm in competition with a, a bunch of people, I'm not really interested. She said, no, we want you to do it. Um, and I thought, well, gee, this is great. So I started working on it, a sketch, and I saw, I usually try to bring up all the past posters and there are a lot of horses and you, can, you have to illustrate Churchill Downs, which is in the background of steeples. Um, and they added some new buildings. So I had to kind of like indicate on the far left and far right what those were. And I did, but I decided to do just one horse. And uh, so I submitted uh, that uh, sketch and I uh, was in the process of putting a number on it. I thought, well, let's just put, uh, let's, Anna, Ann, my wife is talking to her mother in Washington, D.C. And so I asked uh, Ann to ask her mother, uh, give me a number from one to 20. And she chose eight. Uh, and normally she doesn't even, you know, she quibbles about so why do you, why do you want to know, you know, or whatever. So she chose eight right out of the blue. And I put eight down, I submitted my sketch. Uh, the art director said, ooh, I don't know this, you know, everybody's going to be betting on number eight. And this is in November, the thing is in May and it happened to be on my birthday, um, which is really cool. That's another omen. Uh, however, um, so the committee got together and said, well, they, we haven't had just one singular horse there, eight, you know, who cares? You know, people uh, mm -hmm. decide to bet on number eight, all the better. It's, it doesn't matter. Well, number eight won. <laughs> and that's so funny. Yeah. And it was, see, see the title there? You know, that was, This poster was made in November or December, sometime like that. And so they had to get all this other stuff out. And I called it, I titled it out in front. And uh, so I'm sitting there in the booth and watching uh, the race and number eight starts getting way out in front. And of course the art director who's from Kentucky says, this has never happened. This has never happened. <laughs> you know, I said, well, that's great. You know, I'm, I'm honored, uh, but, uh, it was Barbaro who later fell to injuries and couldn't compete anymore. You know, sad story behind that. But if you take a look at the number, just not just the number eight, which was first place, you take a look at the 132nd running of the Roses. 13 came in second, two came in third. I had a trifecta. It's called art magic. <laughs> yeah. I, and can you give me the winning numbers for the one that's coming up this year? I'd like to have I, call, I, your, I, call your mother-in-law again or ask I, me. Yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to uh, go to the great beyond together. Yeah. Okay. Well, ask Ann. She may know what the number is. So now let's, I think we're, what's our next picture there, uh, Pat? What do you have coming up? I think we're coming up to what we're here for, which is hurrah, oh, sure. yeah, sure. is the uh, imageries of what we're uh, going to talk about for the show, which is the Grand Canyon show. And um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the Grand Canyon show and how it came about to be. And then maybe, Pat, you want to show the decals that kind of so you can talk about that as well, if you'll flip ahead. Yeah. Um, now, what Pat might show is how can you see the decals on the interior of that old station, Woody station wagon there? Um, in From the 50s to the 70s, people would go around uh, the country collecting decals to stick in their windows of their automobiles. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, if you are familiar with this, that's just great. But if you aren't, they would do this, uh, you know, they go to Utah or Bryce Canyon or the Yosemite, Yellowstone or or Grand Canyon for that matter. And you could go to the uh, gift shop and, and get a sticker for your car. And so uh, since this is uh, the Grand Canyon State, 
I decided to do uh, the um, Grand Canyon for this one and uh, a couple of others. So uh, it's, it's kind of a travel uh, item. Uh, it's uh, the Grand Canyon State is for me was kind of, okay, how do I show the Grand Canyon State? Well, let's go on a road trip uh, and get around the state a little bit, and, you know, from the south where they, we have the Saguaros to the north where the Grand Canyon and uh, the uh, Indian lands are. Um, it's, you know, it's got so much that uh, I have to, you have to pose it as kind of a road trip. So I thought I would come up with some of these uh, stickers to show everybody where we've been. Okay, so Pat, go back to uh, the imagery and okay. show the, show the yes. beginning one, Pat. Do you have one that shows kind of, so you can see in this image, again, you have to go to YouTube to watch this, but basically you have the figure before he's painted it all in. That's actually his uh, daughter that is the model for that. It looks just like that. You want to show the, the model for this? Uh, we didn't put it on. We didn't. Oh. I was smart enough to know not to put that in this image because your daughter is not going to like it. So she's going to go, why did you put that out on the world? So okay. you don't have well, it up there. <laughs> you sent it, but your daughter can thank me. He posted this one. I have to go back a little bit. Some of these uh, not only had uh, landmarks or states or whatever, they had uh, figures that they would do uh, some cheesecake. Uh, you know, uh, girls in swimsuits. And, and if you were in Florida, of course, they had the Miami or, or California uh, or in New York, you would have a uh, scantily clad uh, lady. So I thought, well, let's do one of those for Arizona. And there she is. Yeah, that's a wonderful called Sheriff Decal. And uh, <laughs> it's a great one. That one actually is, is still available, which is, I'm kind of surprised because it's such a great thing. And so you did some other decals. You did one of a cactus bloom. Right. Um, people are wondering about the cactus being blue. Well, there's a uh, uh, type of cactus that's kind of that. That's an example of, of this blue kind of pink, but sometimes they get really blue from the green. Uh, and it has this beautiful, uh, orange and yellow flower on it. And I thought I would do, there we go, a Santa Rita cactus. And it changes, the green changes to blue through a pink. It goes the green, pink, and blue. And if you're in Arizona, you get all different kinds of colors. And I thought I would put it on a decal. And actually, they, they had a couple of plant decals like that. I just thought of this would be actually very cool to do is actually take those images and actually turn them into real decals. It'd be fun. I'd put one cool. Yeah, we might have to do that, actually. I think it'd be very fun to do that. So um, we'll keep everybody who's watching this live for the, uh, the uh, show in, in the loop on that one. And the next decal that you have, decal painting. These are big paintings, too, by the way. These are not small paintings. These are really big ones. I love this painting. I think it's really phenomenal. Thanks. And we did a video that you can see as well on the on our website or YouTube that is of these paintings. And we did a little animation of the airplane on this one. But maybe you can describe what you what you did with the Grand Canyon National Park decal. Well, uh, I had uh, uh, started. I, I wanted to show. Well, let me start over. Uh, I was reading this book some time ago and got the idea of juxtaposing the 19th century with the 20th century. Uh, and uh, this, this book, Elizabeth Hedgeman's Old Navajo Days, I think it's called. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, she uh, has a whole chapter about airplanes, the first airplanes to fly into the Grand Canyon and to fly over to the uh, Navajo uh, Chanto Airport, I think there was one. Uh, and it has pictures of uh, Navajo people on horses greeting the airplane. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of a very interesting juxtaposition. I, I like painting airplanes. I like painting people on horses. And, 
So let's throw those together. And so I had, had done a few paintings like that. And so uh, why not uh, combine one of those airplanes flying from the Grand Canyon out and having one of the guides looking up. And he's not waving at the airplane plane, but just looking up. Uh, some of the models, I have model airplanes that I use. Oh, uh, here's the model that I use. Uh, there's the airplane, I flipped it so I could get, the, get it going the right way. It's supposed to be going to the east, but uh, go back. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is a friend of mine, Jim Callahan. He owns a uh, Horace Bodie, the horse here. And uh, what we're looking at for those individuals who may not be watching it, but just listening is, you know, it's a model with uh, one of the horses that looks very similar to uh, the painting. Yes. Right. Right. When you uh, look at his head, though, he's wearing a tricorner hat. And I posed him initially uh, for a mural that I was working on for the National Park System, Golden Gate National Park, for the 250th anniversary of uh, Portola, the Spanish explorer's discovery of San Francisco Bay. Uh, so he's on his horse looking down at San Francisco Bay. And they had, you know, it was 1769 uh, that they discovered this. So uh, this huge bay that's not too far from me. Uh, so um, another, I posed uh, Jim in, with a telescope, you know, uh, looking at the bay and right. a whole bunch of but I thought I would read, I would use this particular one of him on the horse, but I replaced his head. I had made him look up at the airplane and there's, there it is. We throw all that stuff together and put it on a, uh, a decal looking uh, image. And yeah, interestingly enough that on the airplane, when it came out to the reservation in the twenties, the Navajos would often trade rugs to go up in the airplanes to be able to see Denata, to see their land. And you would start to see uh, Navajo weavings that had airplanes, sometimes biplanes even, that were in their uh, rugs as pictorials. And those are uh, considered to be, you know, quite valuable because, you know, they're a rare thing. I mean, you can imagine it's a changes the world, right? And with that, you can see the change, right? Yeah, he wouldn't be waving at that plane he that guy would be wondering what the hell that is i mean in you know 1920 is not that long since the plane has been around so kind of an interesting exactly. next uh, image is the arizona spirit arizona spirit it's uh uh i you know wyoming has this uh on its license plate has a uh figure of a cowboy on a bucking bronco you know uh, and uh, Arizona doesn't have that. It has a nice sunset because Arizona has those glorious sunsets. But I also, I wanted to show uh, the cowboy part of Arizona. And uh, he's not on a bucking bronco. He's more has, the two of them have spirit here. And uh, I um, posed, long ago I posed uh, this fellow, a friend of mine, uh, jumping with his horse. Um, because I wanted him jumping over a, an automobile. And this was done for uh, Mark's gallery, for Medicine Man Gallery. It appeared on the cover of um, uh, Western Art Collector and it has uh, Kevin jumping over, uh, you, don't, you guys don't have that one, do you? No, but we might be able to find it. Show us the uh, other image too of the picture that you have of, uh... Uh, there you go. Yeah, there he is. Uh, his horse is just wonderful. He's, he's uh, a, a wonderful horseman, taught my daughter how to ride. Uh, and so, you know, we, we did a, a bunch of these. So I, have, I thought, well, let's go back and look at Kevin on his horse and, and do something. It's not doesn't have to be, uh, uh, have a bucking bronco. It could just be having that spirit. Uh, yeah, a, a horse and, and the rider loving what they're doing. Yeah, and he looks a little younger and thinner as well. Kevin's probably well, going to like you. See, as an artist, <laughs> you have license. Yeah, 
sorry, Kevin. Next uh, image is uh, of, and I will take a look here as soon as he gets to it, is Arizona Velvet. Uh, oh, there's a there's an image that we did put in for those people watching. You can see Kevin going over a horse. That's not the one that was on Western Art Collector's cover, but kind of you can get the sensibility yeah. of what it is. And then Arizona Velvet is this lovely um, Navajo uh, maiden on a horse in uh, looks like Monument Valley. I assume it is, but you can tell us more. Yeah, about that. lots of pictures of Monument Valley. Uh, that I use now, uh, and we try to go there every time we take a road trip out to to Medicine Man or to Santa Fe or, or whatnot. We uh, try to make a detour and go through Hopi and Navajo land, and uh, it's just wonderful to, to go through there. It's so dramatic, and the people are so great. It's, it's great. It shows so, the the image too of the early peace pad of the. So there you can see as a, as a reference back one pad. Yeah. Of well, the, 19 kind of a 1930s point, 40s thing what i wanted to point out here is notice the blanket it has fringe on it you see that now a man would not have fringe on their blanket or on their serape or anything like that well um, I'll, I'll i'll break with that and say that they might because they would also have these things which are called sunday saddles which would just be fancy saddles so it's possible uh, they could just for clarification okay. <laughs> Mark, Mark, you would know that more than I would, but I, uh, when I was at, uh, how, how do you say, Tignos Post? Yeah, Tignos Post. Mm -hmm. Tignos Post. Uh, I was looking at the, the blankets and going to buy one. I said, what about this fringe? He says, oh, no, that's for ladies. Yeah. That's a, um, that, that, yeah, that may be oh, for more okay. contemporary, and that may be a contemporary thing. I could see that. But the old ones, which were these 1890s Germantown ones, they would call them Sunday saddles or going to, you know, where it'd be really fancy. They'd only wear it periodically. But yeah, I love that. I love that. And there's yeah. there's the image in your so, studio. Yeah, let's do, yeah, let's do uh, a lady with her fringe. Uh, and uh, so this is starting out, walking out. I usually uh, coat the canvas with a tone, uh, a warm color, usually a raw sienna, uh, so that the value of paint uh, both lights and darks are, are, are neutralized. Uh, if you paint just on a white canvas, your darks tend to be too light and your lights tend to be, uh, it, 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 it doesn't work. So I, that's, that's why you see this kind of wash on the background. So the next uh, shows a little more filler. I tend to use dark colors first. I wanted to get the figure and the horse just right. And so uh, that's why I painted her first. Uh, there were some other iterations that I did of her face. I moved a few things around uh, and uh, of the horse's head and whatnot. So as I paint, I go along and I and I uh, I'll modify things so it, it looks uh, in my mind better. Yeah, and there's an image. I'll go back to it just one second again, if you would, Pat. But uh, the image, yeah, I just. I also love the name Arizona Velvet. Who came up with that name? It's such a fantastic, you know, they wear these velveteen skirts and shirts. And and, and just raised your hand. Yeah, that was a great one. I, I, I frequently come up with names, but uh, when I'm kind of like, like, gee, you know, I can't just say woman on a horse in Monument Valley or something. <laughs> what do you think we ought to, because she owns uh, a velvet, uh, you know, dress outfit you know, a, a Pueblo or Navajo, I guess it's Navajo, isn't uh, it? Yeah, Navajo outfit in green and it's velvet. And she said, um, yeah, just, uh, it's all kind of Navajo velvet. It's, it's, uh, yes, it's, Arizona. Like a it's like a movie title. I mean, it fits the piece perfectly. I'm, oh. you know, often I don't remember titles unless they're really, uh, they fit nicely or they really make the, painting and in this case i thought that title was just brilliant and and the reason why i put arizona up there is because if you keep in mind that this is the grand canyon state we're on a road trip so uh some of these pieces i'd say uh 60 of them have type on them and that's comes that's that's from my background as an illustrator i love doing type and it's part of the art uh, but it's also um indicates uh to me, uh, a throwback to a time where we could travel. 
easily and uh, to a time where uh, you're, you're compelled to go and see these places. And so uh, it, it just reminiscent of that. I, I just love throwing that in there to, to give it a sense of uh, travel. Well, and also I just point out that those are hand painted letters. I mean, those are things that you actually hand paint and Dixon would do those same things when he would do uh, different uh, things like that. He did one for uh, for the Santa Fe Railroad. Um, and we have one of those in our museum. And, you know, it's a really, it's a, yeah, like you said, it's a throwback. And I, I love the idea that, you know, it's a throwback till to two years ago because we really haven't been able to do much travel since. So, well, can we get a close up of that type? Is that, yeah. Patrick? So you can see the hand lettering on these and, you yeah. know, just, I don't know, it, it adds something to the whole concept of the show. Uh, this particular piece is no longer available, but a few of these others that we do have are. Next piece. Yeah. I love this. Uh, yeah, this, this was fun. Uh, this is called Curios and it's yes. a concrete uh, teepee and <laughs> old truck. I, I going through Arizona to Santa Fe on Route 66. There's a motel uh, called uh, uh, the Wigwam, and it's in Holbrook. And they're all concrete. I stayed in that place. after passing by it several times. It was it was I was compelled to try to stay in in the thing. It wasn't uh, great, but it was interesting to be able to go there. And they had a lot of old cars parked out in front. They kind of had my my thing, you know, going to this place. And so uh, this car, this truck uh, is owned by somebody in Glen Ellen. That's Anne, my wife, uh, I replaced her head, but we do have that Serape and uh, she, we have uh, pots that are like that. And I'm the guy uh, taking the rug out of the truck there. I'll point um, out my logo is on the teepee, by the way. That's right, <laughs> there it is. And uh, it could be on uh, Anne's Serape, too. I'm not yeah, sure. the Satya Serape design, yeah. Exactly. There, so, we there, have an there, image of the actual place, I guess. I saw this old photograph, uh, and there's a neon sign that really isn't uh, clearly, and I can reinvent it, I suppose. That would be fun to do that. But uh, this is uh, appears along Route 66 somewhere. It doesn't say where, but um, there it is. There's, there's, I needed to do that. I, I don't think it exists anymore. Probably not. And then the next piece is uh, evening chat. Evening chat. It's, it's a smaller piece and I wanted to show uh, a couple of cowboys uh, uh, just kind of uh, getting together uh, as an illustrator. Um, we were told that what you're doing is either uh, redefining a story, telling a story, or uh, illuminating something in a story. And so what I'm doing here is telling a story, but the story is yours. What are they doing? You can, you can have this and it could become a conversation piece. Yeah. She's saying to him, did you bring your cell phone? And he's looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. That's probably not the one. Next photo. Can I have one of those? Or, uh, yeah, Monument one? Valley. I'll tell you a very funny story, actually, that just does it. I had this Buck Dunton that was done in 1907, actually. And the guy's looking at a spur in the background at this uh, on this um, counter. It's a 1907 painting. And this kid came in and goes, I didn't think they had cell phones back then because he's looking at a spur and it looks like he's looking at a cell phone or at least that's how the kid interpreted it in today's thing and i was like oh my gosh yeah here we are that's what that's they don't even understand what that means so monument valley I, i've seen those the, those clips before i've been there tell us a little bit about this particular piece well um there are a lot of um, figures on horses and i pose my neighbors Anne poses, Sophia, of course, poses. Uh, and sometimes we have a horse. 
uh, that we pose on. So, uh, and I dress them in uh, different outfits, uh, wrap them in blankets and everything. So uh, here's uh, a horse uh, and a figure, horseman. And I invented the rocks, but the uh, background is actually from Monument Valley. If we have that, uh, there it is. There's a picture of mine that I took. Um, and it doesn't have the nice, wonderful clouds behind it, but I, you know, it's artistic license again. I can invent them. Yes. And then next photo, next painting that we have is of uh, out of the Mojave, which is a Mojave cactus tree. And uh, in bloom, it looks like as well, which. Yeah, a Joshua tree or Mojave tree, as they yeah. sometimes call them. Uh, there are different species that happen, mostly in California, southern Nevada, and up around the Grand Canyon, uh, Kingman, Arizona, uh, that area there is part of the Mojave. And uh, so I was stretching it maybe a little bit because I've been to the California Joshua tree. And uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful uh, all times during the day. There's, um, one, there's one just like that, that size next to my house. So they're here too in Tucson. Though, oh, of course, it wasn't indigenous to this area, but, you know, they will survive here. Oh, they're, they're beautiful. They're, they're, they're just great. Um, the coyote, it, it's, it's put together. It's, it's a cloud that I took. It's a hillside that I don't think is in, in uh, Mojave. It could be because uh, there's some sagebrush below it, very much like you see there. The Joshua tree is two trees that I put together and I was feverishly trying to find them today so I could have them as reference for, for our talk. And I was also trying to find, uh, I couldn't find them and I also couldn't find the fellow there, the coyote, which was in, uh, well, Jack London, basically in the park. And I was, Ann and I were jogging and there he or she was uh, up about 50 yards up a hill and just standing there for the longest time. And I had uh, uh, my camera and I was able to take pictures of them. And I have lots of shots of, of that guy. So I threw him into the Mojave. So now he's out of the Mojave. Yep, next photo. This was fun. Uh -huh. This one's sold, but it's a very fun imagery. Well, there were other things besides cowboys, Indians, uh, mountains, and animals. Uh, the other thing was the entertainment, the, thing, the fun things that you do in Arizona. And when we go to Medicine Man, we usually stay at the Arizona Inn. They have a fabulous pool. I like the warmth. You just dive in and it's, you don't have to go, ooh. You know, there's no kind of uh, uh, shock that you get. And they have, uh, it's kind of like this. And I can imagine what it looked like since it's an old hotel that dates back to the 20s, I think even maybe a little earlier. Uh, they've had guests and, and they have pictures on the wall of, of, of women uh, in their bathing suits and, and stuff uh, from that period. And I thought, well, let's just show a little bit of the uh, fun, activities that Arizonans or tourist Arizonans uh, do when they're when they're here, there in Arizona or over here, but uh, can't wait to go back. Uh, anyway, here's, here's this uh, uh, lady coming up out of the pool and uh, she initially had a full head of hair, but I thought uh, let's, and, but she had that bathing suit and I think it had some sort of flowers on. I took the flowers off and I decided to put a bathing cap on uh, because it just fit the period. Yeah. Uh, like period stuff. Yep. Next photo. Ah, uh, Sororo National Park, another travel poster. Um, uh, I've done a lot of paintings of saguaros and I love the odd ones that uh, either have too many limbs or not enough limbs or a broken limb or two. And, um, uh, a few horsemen, you know, it's just uh, a thing that will, compels you to come to well, Arizona and enjoy its natural wonders on horseback. Yeah, everyone loved that painting. Uh, next photo. 
I love this one personally. And we have the El Charo or uh, one of the restaurants. I don't remember exactly which one. It's off of Campbell and River. Um, yeah. Of the Bucking um, Bronco, which you see all the time here in Tucson. Yeah, I had to do a Bucking Bronco. And I figured, okay, let's put it on uh, Desert Evening Ride. Uh, there are a number of factors here. Uh, the Wigwam, uh, uh, that's, I wanted to represent the Wigwam Hotel again, or motel. But um, I don't think they have that neon sign there. I don't, you know, I kind of reinvented that after looking at something else. But everything else, um, the desert drive in where it says eat, I wanted this picture to feel like the neon was just turned on. You're coming into town or you're coming into a restaurant or a motel after a long desert drive with your canvas water bag attached to your car in case the car starts boiling over in the heat. And there you are at the Miracle Mile, all lit up. Uh, the diving girl shows you that the motel is nearby uh, with a pool to refresh yourself in like the pink uh, uh, girl, the pink uh, bathing cap girl. And then El Corral is the name of the steakhouse. Yeah, that's it. And uh, I needed to, since it's Tucson down there, I wanted to show Tucson. We, you know, we, we could go almost everywhere else in Arizona, but uh, there's uh, El Corral in the middle there. This is uh, starting the, the painting. You can see uh, uh, how I look at my uh, iPad rather than paper. I, I put things on the, on the uh, computer uh, into iPhone into photo. And then uh, I sit there looking at my iPad painting pictures. So you can see off to the lower left on a music stand there. But uh, the painting, I wanted to get the car just right. And it's even though it's not finished completely, the left, the right headlight, the one on the right, is not finished painting. It, it hasn't been finished yet. Uh, there's things in the windshield and whatnot. But uh, I generally, what I do is from this point, I take the painting, turn it upside down because I don't want paint to fall on the already painted uh, Studebaker. And uh, I paint it upside, turn up turn the uh, imagery on, on my reference upside down. I turn the painting upside down and I can uh, paint without uh, worrying uh, about destroying my painting or having to repaint mm -hmm. it. Yeah, Ed, Ed does that, Ed Mel does that. He turns them upside down and sideways and it's very interesting. And you have in this thing, the desert, uh, if we can just see that image one more time, Pat, the desert bag, I love that, the old water bags that you would have on these because the thing would overheat. Right, and it would say on the, on the back of that water bag, it says, uh, soak before using. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And then of course, the license plate that says Grand Canyon State on it. Yeah, that's a great painting. Somebody in Tucson, whoever's listening to this, you should buy this. And I love this painting. And I think it's still available. So it's an amazing <laughs> image. I mean, it really is. It's what, it's Tucson. It's, you know, the 50s. It's just, yet you still have the the one uh, El uh, Corral is still lit up and is a great restaurant. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's real Tucson. And I think we, do we have any more photos? I think we're kind of done with that, Pat. Now, I think we're going to open this up for some questions uh, that people might have. And maybe, Pat, you want to say something here? Well, good afternoon, everyone. If you don't know me, my name is Pat, and I do the marketing and graphics for Medicine Man. So if you participated in any of our previous Q&As, you'll know that the way we do it is you type your question into the chat and I'll read it to Dennis and then he'll answer it. So let me open up this chat. If you'll notice there's a little dialogue bubble like in a comic book at the bottom of the Zoom interface. And that's where we're gonna type them in. So if anyone has any questions, now's the best shot to uh, chat them up and yeah, let her rip. And as you can see, Pat is in San Francisco right now. I thought he was actually next door, but he's not in the Maynard Dixon Museum. So 
but he picked, a, he picked <laughs> an appropriate place for a San Franciscan. As they're doing that, um, I'm just going to ask Dennis while you get to the questions that might come in. So Dennis, what's it like doing these virtual um, openings versus, I don't know if you did, you had an opening recently and I assume they did a virtual opening as well. And is it, No, uh, I've never had a virtual opening. You're the first. Wow. Uh, I, I prefer them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a misanthrope by any stretch. I like hanging out with people. I love meeting people in, in person. But, you know, with the pandemic thing, this is, wow. You know, we couldn't have done this 10 years ago. You know, this is, uh, this is amazing. I get to come to my opening and stay at home. I know. I like it too, as well. And you don't have to fly out. And um, yeah, no, there is some advantages to doing this. I, I was surprised how much I do like them uh, to, you know, I don't know. It's just a different concept. And yeah, we'll put, uh, you know, you don't get to see the images on the wall. That's one of the things that really is a, is a beautiful thing to see. And I will make sure that we get that up there so people can see what it looks like on the wall. So it looks like we might have a, a couple of questions there, Pat. Yeah. So our first question is from another Dennis, and he asks, what's your attraction to trains because you capture them so well? Oh, uh really too bad I didn't put a train in this now because the uh, uh, Santa Fe uh, and, and the Southern Pacific go, go through, well, Southern Pacific goes to Tucson. Um, I don't know. I, I think uh, growing up uh, in San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area, uh, I had grandparents that lived in Palo Alto, only a block away from the railroad station there. And so the Southern Pacific um, uh, Daylight, which was a train, express train that would go from San Francisco to Los Angeles would fly by, or I, I think it stopped in Palo Alto and it was such a beautiful train. And um, we could hear it, we could hear it rumbling. Uh, and I would you know, run down the block just to see it. And I became fascinated at that point in time with trains and then they got rid of all the steam trains and uh, trains were still very interesting, but they, you know, the chugging and the puffing and the rumbling and the whistles and all that were gone. And uh, so I try to bring them back. Uh, so that's why I have a fascination with those and uh, painting them kind of like uh, is nostalgic for me. I kind of kind of bring them back in my mind. Oh, that's wonderful. All right. Well, our next question is from Peter, and he asks. For this kind of theme to show, do you have a clear concept at the start of the images that you want to paint, or do they emerge one by one as you get down to work? Whoa, Peter. Um, wow. Um, I have ideas coming out my ears uh, all the time, and it's the, pro the project is to try to pin down which ones should go in this show. I have a lot of ideas. Um, and I come up with new ones. I'll see, I'll do some research on the one that I think is gonna be really good for the show. And it turns out uh, that when I look up reference or look at my own photographs and start coming up, start talking to people about stuff, the, the thing rolls into another idea. Uh, so the only problem is, is uh, Selecting which ones, yeah. Uh, you know, kind of winnowing out ones that might not, well, winnowing ones that maybe you could use later, perhaps. All that, right. That and you talk to your ga your gallerist and get a little sense going on too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so our next question is from Gina and she says, Greetings from Napa, Dennis. Love your work. As a fellow Californian, do you think that we're underrepresented in Western art circles? Geographically speaking, we are pretty dang Western. Gina, hooray. Yes, there is so much West out here that we're much bigger than those other ones, other states. I mean, um, after completing the um, 
mural for the uh, National Park about Portola discovering San Francisco Bay. All these people on horses, the missions, uh, the railroads coming through, the, the uh, uh, there's just so much. There's ranches out here. There, uh, when I, I had a whole series of, of paintings that I can't use really because uh, no gallery I think will, would want them, save maybe one, but uh, is uh, one about early LA before automobiles. Um, Pasadena had orange groves all over it. A train would come through. I could paint a train with uh, piles of oranges on, on a cart, you know, people picking oranges, uh, ranch, rancheros and ranches uh, all over Southern and, and Northern California for that matter. There, there's a lot of West out here. Uh, there's there are the mountains, there's the deserts, there are even the beaches, cowboys on the beaches. <laughs> Don't do that painting for me, please. Do not do that <laughs> painting for me, please. Okay. <laughs> All right, this one's from Dick and he says, Hi, Mark, Dennis and Ann from Dick and Lisa. No question, but congratulations on the wonderful collection and exhibit. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, our love, Ann says our love. So I actually got a question. I actually have seen a painting of yours that's a big old saguaro with a lightning bolt in the background and the way that the light from the lightning bolt reflects on the saguaro was just fascinating to me when I first saw it. And now that I saw this Mojave desert painting with the sunrise or sunset behind the Joshua tree, I, the, the way that you play with the light through the bristles, through the, the texture of the Joshua tree is just, it's just really puzzling to me. So I guess which one's more difficult to paint between the Saguaro oh. and the Joshua tree? Well, to tell you the truth, even though the Saguaro seems simple in its form, uh, a Joshua tree is much easier to paint. Uh, because uh, you can fool with it. You, know, you, can, you can do some, you can wave wands over it. I, you know, I'd have to really get into the techniques of how I paint that. Uh, uh, so while, uh, if you don't paint it just right, uh, it, it's gonna look too, too much of a characterization or a cartoon. Uh, you really have to examine, I, I did a lot of, looking at saguaros to make sure that I wasn't offending mother nature, let alone other people. Yeah, I actually look, as a dealer, I actually look at that um, when artists, especially if they submit art to me, you know, for possible representation, if they can't paint a saguaro, if they can't, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the criteria because they are difficult. They're not easy to do. They, they're not just stick figures. They have all sorts of shapes and different uh, characters and, um, light on them makes them look orange at times. It's, you know, so they're, you know, just from a standpoint of what I've seen, it's, it's one of the more difficult things I think to actually capture. There are, there are so many anomalies when it comes to uh, Saguaro uh, that you, you, I try to pull out uh, to make it e my job easier because I love painting them. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I think, um, uh, just to say it, they're, they're not that easy, but I have a whole lot of fun doing them. All right, and our next question is from Michael. And Michael asks, there was talk of doing decals, uh, any possibility of prints? Uh, well, Michael, I, I don't know. Uh, you might want to talk to Mark about that. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> yeah, we can actually, we can discuss it. Um, we haven't, you know, it's interesting. We don't do a lot of prints with artists um, and I don't know exactly why, um, but from a time concept and, a, and just an economic one, sometimes it's difficult to do. Uh, but I do like the idea of actually doing little decals. I think that would be super fun. And even if it's a, you know, a money loser, which it would be, it would just be fun. And sometimes in art and do shows and things, you want to do things that are fun and it's not a money thing. It's just a, you know, how, how fun would it be to have, you know, those to give out to people who buy the paintings and people who even don't just to have a Dennis Semensky decal. So that one will be continued. Okay. All right. I think we've kind of covered it all. Is there any other questions, Pat? 
You know what? I don't see any more rolling in. So if any Great. of the Perfect. participants. Perfect. Perfect time. Again, this will be in the Art Dealer Diaries podcast coming out and uh, not this next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. So hopefully you can, uh, if you want to see it again, you can listen to it again. And uh, Dennis, any last, you know, additions that you like to say about your show? The show is going to run through the month of, of uh, March uh, and a little bit beyond into April. So hopefully people can actually come and view the show. It's a really phenomenal show, but any question, any uh, final remarks, Dennis? Um, no, just come, uh, you know, go to, Mark Sublet's Medicine Man uh, website, medicinemangallery.com, uh, and to have a, have a closer look. Uh, if you get a chance and, and can get to Tucson, you can have a really good look. Um, but uh, Mark, thank you for uh, having me uh, come join you, uh, all of you, Patrick, yourself, Kathleen, Jamie, uh, all of you stay well. And uh, thanks. Thanks for everybody for coming and taking the time to listen. It looked like everybody stayed on, which I love. Hope you enjoyed the time. I know it was fun for me. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel. So make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.